Welcome back, everyone, to episode two of the I Progress podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Dean. And I'm your second host, Craig. So today we're going to be talking about mental health in academia. And it's kind of irrelevant of whether you're a student, a PhD student, a early career researcher or a full-fledged professor. Mental health is pervasive across everybody. Um, obviously, we do our best to keep our heads above the water. But should we actually be having to do that? You know, this is perhaps one of the only professions in the world where it seems to be normalized perhaps on social medias and that's something we're going to be talking about later on in the episodes in terms of all of this pressure that academics are faced with so craig moving into our kind of first subtopic of the day talking about the kind of scope of mental health in academia what i thought i might do is just read out to you three findings over the last five years and getting your takes on them and maybe let's have a discussion around them okay sure. so First of all, this is a from a study by Evans et al. in 2018. 2,000-odd uh, participants across 26 countries, okay, so we're talking kind of worldwide here, reported that grad students are more than six times as likely to experience depression and anxiety compared to the general population. We have a study by Leverkue et al. 2017, so five years ago, a near 4,000 sample of PhD students from Belgium. They indicated a prevalence of what the research paper called psychiatric disorders um, being higher amongst academics than generally um, highly educated populations. And also a report from 2019 that was reported in Nature shows that over 6,000 participants, 36% said that they had sought help for anxiety and depression, which they professed was caused by their PhD studies. What's your kind of initial thoughts on those findings? Well, I mean, initially, obviously, they're, they're really troubling. Um, what was the first stat? Six times more likely to experience depression? Was that? Uh, that yes, you... yes. So, so more than six times as likely to experience depression and anxiety compared to the general population. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's probably consistent with what I would, maybe slightly higher than what I would expect, I guess, mm -hmm. among, among PhD students. Um, I know when I was doing my PhD, I struggled a little bit with anxiety, depression, maybe not depression as much, but anxiety, definitely. Um, and I think that's quite a common experience, actually, in terms of people maybe thinking through what their what their role is in, in this kind of higher education ecosystem, thinking about where they fit in. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure one thing that we'll mention a few times in this episode is imposter syndrome. Sure. Thinking sure. about where people, um, whether they fit in in, in academia at all. Um, but yeah, obviously, huge numbers of people experiencing things like anxiety and depression um the interesting one for me though was around the the final stat so people reporting uh depressive symptoms or anxiety related directly to their phd yeah. studies do you have any more information about that is that something that you've looked into no so i have i haven't looked into it in kind of too much detail i just kind of grabbed these off uh for the uh episode but it was a uh it was a global survey which was for doctoral students specifically so i think that might be something useful for us to look into for the crib notes for this episode uh which will obviously obviously attached to every episode going forward for me though there's two key points here. There's the sheer amount of numbers in terms of these samples. So we're not just talking about sub 100 or 100 to 1,000 participants. We're talking in excess of 2.5K for each of these studies. Secondly, it's not just being located to one country. Okay, so these are international uh, findings across the globe and it's showing that whatever this underpinning is whether it's a direct cause of the PhD or whether it's academia more pervasively there's something here that's troublesome there's something here that perhaps needs to be done at least looked at what is the exact mechanism which is relating undergoing higher education undergoing PhD study walking into academia which is if not causing, severely contributing to poor mental health. I guess if, if we start thinking about PhD 
students, PhD candidates, and what their experience is like. A lot of the time, there's a there's a clock on their project, so they have a deadline that they have to work to. They have a maximum registration period. Um, at least in the UK, that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that kind of impending kind of deadline, I guess, all the time of having to maybe look over your shoulder and thinking through, am I making enough progress? We know that there are uh, high levels of kind of social comparison that people kind of engage with, looking at their friends, looking at people on their cohort, thinking about whether or not they are keeping up with their colleagues. So maybe there's something in that. Um, obviously, there's things around workload and burnout, particularly among early career um, researchers. I know that I struggled, still do struggle quite a bit with that sometimes, thinking through mm. how do I manage this kind of the sheer volume of work that is kind of in academia. Um, so there's various different ways that we can think about this, I suppose. 100%. And, and I kind of guess something that perhaps you didn't uh, touch on there that just to give the whole picture is with PhD students specifically, oftentimes one of the key metrics to being awarded a PhD is this unique contribution of knowledge. Okay. And we're in a very fast paced world at the minute where people are being taught to jump on key social issues and develop impactful research about that. And I know a PhD student that I've uh, coached in the past, she came to the first year of her PhD. She's invested so much time into that work only to find a paper that was just coming out in, in publication that from the title was extremely similar to her PhD topic. And I think that that's actually something which is, um, you you know, I don't know if it's faced by every single PhD student, but it was certainly faced um, by her. Uh, Luckily, I think in in that case, uh, the paper wasn't as, um, let's let's say the paper wasn't as solid, you know, as as, as it should have been. And so so, so, so their PhD work uh, was able to overcome those limitations that actually made their work stronger. But I would say that's a cause for concern for any PhD student, you know, that your work might be getting scoped or or stolen from under you oh 100 i had exactly that experience when i started my phd the first week um i had an idea of the the first study that i wanted to run did start doing my lit review for uh that study and one of the first hits was exactly what i was going to be doing looking at the same manipulation the same outcomes wow it was identical so yeah i completely kind of appreciate how difficult that is and thinking about then what do you do how do you regroup um, I think people who are post PhD also experience this. I know when I started doing more independent work, it was about kind of how do I kind of map out a route for myself that isn't my supervisors or isn't my advisors mm. um, area of research. How do I make a name for me rather than being my supervisor's supervisee, if that makes sense. I don't know if you've had similar experiences. I know that people that we work with have had similar kind of concerns. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it was really important for me coming to the kind of end of my PhD that I was able to walk out of my current institution. I know lots of people find that they uh, feel at home in the institution they've done their PhDs in. You know, it's uh, of oftentimes it might be, um, and I'm going to use quotes for people who uh, aren't watching this on YouTube. Um, it, it might be a little bit easier to, to, to stay in, in the kind of current institution and, and, and kind of get employment there. Uh, But for me, it was really important that I was able to step away from that institution and not become um, Professor X's student, even when I'm actually in that, uh, even when I'm actually in that job, although I would love to become Professor X's student. Um, So I think that, yes, it's really important to be carving a name out for yourself. I think if you don't you you stand to kind of lose a lot of ground in the academic community and and because we're talking you know about mental health that's something which i think could potentially be one of the core underpinnings of um phd students walking into that early career uh, academic role and i know in a, in a couple of minutes time we're going to be moving on to talking about some of the potential causes of 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 this poor mental health but i think it's it's a really good place to just kind of acknowledge that the statistics uh, these aren't cherry picked um, studies that I thought I'd introduce us to in the slightest. These are studies which you know are just the top three of a large cohort of potential studies I could have presented for us to to discuss. Large numbers, 
international application, it suggests that something needs to be done. Oh, 100 percent. And I think it, for people that are listening, if they are in this kind of situation, thinking about the fact that you're not by yourself, I think it's quite easy for people when they are um, struggling with mental health issues in academia to feel quite isolated, particularly when we're in this environment where it's it's quite kind of normalized to think about outputs and productivity and sheer numbers of publications or papers or students that you're teaching. Um, you hear a lot of success stories in academia and it's quite difficult sometimes to get some of those um, more negative experiences heard. So things like rejections that you get from journal articles, rejections from job applications and kind of where that leaves you and how that leaves you feeling um, can be quite isolating, I think. So we're acknowledging actually that there's a sizable proportion of academia that is feeling similar uh, or similarly to how, how you are is is. I don't want to say reassuring because mm. it, we, we shouldn't be in this situation, um, but it certainly should feel hopefully less isolating. I think we're, we've kind of reached a critical mass at one point of of if we if we have this kind of sheer number, the sheer volume of people experiencing mental health issues related to their work in academia, it it becomes incumbent on universities, on regulators, on editors, on all of these various stakeholders in academia. To actually do something about it then, to think, think about what workloads look like, to think about training, to think about how we can develop a, a context of higher education that is more realistic to what people can do, the capacities that people have in terms of their time and their uh, mental resource, but also their mental well-being and how do we maximise that. And I think that's what we're trying to do as well with our progress. 100% and uh, I, I was just thinking as, as you were saying that yes that is on, on one hand that is exactly what we're trying to do we're trying to normalize this discussion without scaring people away from the profession but as you were saying that what a huge hill we have to climb you know not only do we have to establish this we have to get people talking about it and then we actually have to reach out to these people that can be making a difference and persuade them that they need to make a difference. So I guess thinking about the scope of mental health um, issues in higher education, um, what do you think from your mind is kind of some of the causes? What are the key causes that maybe at different career stages? Yeah, sure. Um, I think what I'd like to start on this is maybe talking about uh, from the perspective of a, of a PhD student. Now, I, I know we're kind of marketing... Uh, this podcast series and the company as a whole at you know a whole range of individuals in academia including undergraduate students but I think that perhaps the the experience of undergraduate students might be qualitatively different and I think it might deserve um, a, a podcast of its own you know in, in kind of upcoming weeks so if I can just take kind of hold from maybe postgraduate students so master students who are walking into the uh, into the PhD, the the first word that comes to mind uh, for me is a lack of preparation. Okay, so I remember that when I was um, an undergraduate student and I was going into my master's program, I wasn't prepared for the step up. Okay, I, I knew it was going to be harder. I knew there's going to be a lot more work involved, but I wasn't prepared for exactly how much work. I wasn't prepared for the fact that perhaps all of these writing techniques that I've been taught for the for the last uh, two or three years might need to change. I might need to adapt them. And the reason I say that is because actually when I then left from my master's to start my PhD, it was at the same institution. Um, I felt that a lot more was expected of me. I felt that perhaps, yes, there was kind of workshops and, you know, talks that was held every week or two. But I feel that the amount of um, feedback that I'd got back from my first four years of academia didn't in any way hardly <laughs> map on to what I was expected to do in the the, the, the PhD. Okay, so I felt underprepared. Is, is that something that kind of resonates with you or, or was that just my experience? Oh, 100%, yeah. Um, not even necessarily just about the academic side of the job, but also thinking through the whole mindset of being a, a PhD candidate, the, the way that you have to organise your own time, the way that you are completely kind of self-driven, I guess, thinking about, um, I mean, you get done what you're willing to do on any particular day. 
there's no timetable that you need to uh, stick to. There's no timetable for you to follow. Um, going back to the writing, though, I think there's a tendency for undergraduate students, for master students, to write to assessment briefs. So you have these kind of marking criteria that you are kind of beholden to, and if the extent to which you stick to that or not will determine what grade you get. And at the end of the day, a PhD is totally different to that. There's a, it's a different sure. way of thinking, a different way of writing. Um, so yeah, completely agree. It's not something that you are prepared for, I don't think, at the beginning, unless you've done stuff on the side in terms of research assistant work or kind of trying to get involved in research in other ways. Um, you know, you don't. I, I personally didn't feel uh, prepared for that step up at all. And and, and I kind of guess just building on that answer that you. You, you you go into the role it's very much self-guided you might have a lot of kind of you know pushback from various individuals in your life so for example your supervisors and whatnot who who are trying to direct you but that might come at perhaps dissonance with with your ideas and your goals and it's ultimately like you have 101 tasks in, in your in your notebook your, your to-do list and you don't know where to start you don't know how to manage those tasks effectively and perhaps we're seeing these large numbers of uh, detrimented mental health in PhD students because there's there's very little guidance there. You know, you if you if you don't have any guidance in terms of what should take priority, um, what needs to be done by when, if you if you go from that mindset of these assessment briefs almost guiding you, handholding you, I guess through your degree, or especially kind of showing you exactly what's necessary to to achieve well in that degree, and suddenly you're left to figure out how to succeed on your own just going cold turkey um that can put you in a position where perhaps you're trying to do all of these various things at once you know because you don't know what you need to prioritize or what should pay off yeah and i think this is kind of the value hopefully of of podcasts like these where we can share our own experiences and think about how we've maybe navigated some of those i think as i think we can still probably call ourselves younger um researchers we're we're not that far out of that um, that process. I know we're kind of becoming established researchers, but um, it's not that long ago that we were kind of navigating this kind of early parts of the PhD. So I think we can pass on a lot of experience from from that process. And what I don't want this to do actually is to turn into a way of basically us criticising uh, more established PhD supervisors because I think supervisors do a really good job. They do the best that they can. But ultimately, we're as supervisors as well. We're, we're supervising PhD students now. We're not trained to to be career coaches, if that makes sense, in terms of that PhD context. We're trained to help people to do good research. And I think there's a there maybe a little bit of a um, I don't not necessarily a competition, but or a conflict. But there is a, a a difficulty in terms of how do you marry up that role? How do you make it so that you are not just there for academic progression but also personal and career progression and so, i know it's something that we're quite kind of keen on on looking at and trying to develop in our work but also kind of trying to diffuse that or kind of take that into a, a broader academic context yeah no i i, I completely uh, i completely agree and resonate with that uh, so as, as 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 you know and, and i don't know if any of our kind of listeners will know um but alongside kind of the academic world i've also been involved in, in coaching uh, for, for, for quite a while and so because of that i feel that i can offer a slightly different service to perhaps other phd supervisors i know how to coach and mentor people through various elements you know be that academic or just more broader kind of uh, life coaching but to marry that with what you've just said, no PhD stu- uh, PhD supervisors rather, they they aren't taught all of these techniques. Now, obviously, there's kind of workshops and seminars to develop those skills, but each supervisor will be coming into that role with different toolkits, and I think that's important uh, to remember. And, and definitely, um, each to their own in that, and, and and we shouldn't be kind of putting any kind of blame on on the supervisors. So what's your opinion of the kind of potential causes for poor mental health as we move towards early career academics after they've completed their phds uh, i mean i mean i don't think they're that different to be honest i think the lack of preparation for for what it actually looks like what your workload looks like is is lacking there's, a, there's definitely a lack of preparation there 
Um, so thinking through, obviously, you know, as part of your PhD, what good research should look like. You've hopefully published a couple of papers. You've hopefully done a little bit of teaching maybe as well. But the the sheer increase in the workload, I don't think is something that you're really prepared for. So um, kind of trying to juggle different roles. It might be that some people have got their first academic role before they finish their PhD. So they're mm. trying to maybe finish that thesis, trying to get through that viva examination, um, while also trying to develop that that new PhD or that new research stream, whilst also managing new academic roles, new administration roles, figuring out how to use different learning management systems, figuring out how do you be a personal tutor to 10 or 15 different students, all of which have slightly different needs. Um, how do you- The list goes on. <laughs> materials? There's just so much to do. Um, and I think there's a tendency, particularly in the early years of, of being an academic, that you try and take on all of these different roles because you're just eager to please. Sure. Um, sure. There's lots of emphasis, I suppose, on trying to develop different areas of competency because I think in the back of your mind, you may be thinking about maybe in, I don't know, five, six years' time, you might want to go for a promotion or if you're in the States, you might have a tenure clock that you're working to. Mm -hmm. So the more service you can do, the more teaching you can do, the more research you can get out, um, the better for your future career or so that's what the kind of mindset is and I know that that you've thought about the the value of saying no to things as well I don't know if you want to give us an overview of what your what your yeah. thoughts are on that. so um, I, I published a, an article in the Times Higher Education which I'll, I'll, I'll link in the crib sheet um, I think it was around about this time last year um, and essentially what that article was titled was how to um, successfully say no and it did get a lot of heat um, in terms of when it got kind of released on social media. Because I, th I think the, the the core aim that I was trying to get across in, in this article was that, as you've just very eloquently described, early career academics have lots of very much competing um, job roles. Um, I think importantly in the first year they might even be completing their PhD as well and so actually it's it that's that has lots of importance and so how does that marry with with the rest of the kind of academic duties and I think that uh, when we are trying to impress when we are looking ahead to try and get these promotions we tend just to say yes to everything you know we say we say yes to sitting on on the committee we say yes to reviewing papers we say yes to taking part in research which isn't really in our field but we might be able to make a new network or a new collaborator you know we might be asked to we might be invited onto a paper because we have spe spe uh, specific expertise in a particular um analysis and we might be asked to to mentor um, PhD students or, or postgraduate um, researchers as well. And so because of all of these factors, yes, we don't know what is a priority. And, and the key question that I asked um, several institutions when I was doing a little bit of recce work for this was, if you want to get promoted, what do you put highly on on your kind of um, CV? What what is, what is the key thing that you need to um, hit? What are these metrics? How do you measure success in your field and very few academics or institutions could actually say to me well to get promoted here you need five papers in this particular area you need to have supervised x amount of phd students yourself you need to sit on two committees each of which for six months these metrics just aren't clearly defined and so it puts the emphasis back on the early career academic to just say yes to everything because they hope to catch a break you know you need a lot of look in academia as well because these boundaries aren't very clearly um defined and i think one of the key things that i learned when i was writing this article as, as brief article as it was was that when individuals were um saying yes to things oftentimes they were doing so without their line managers uh, knowledge or understanding and so the impact that this has is if you continuously say yes to things you're not informing your line manager and as such it's not going on your workload plan and suddenly your line manager is looking outwards saying well actually i think this academic 
is doing okay because you know their, their workload plan says they've got 100 percent of their hours complete with various duties that should be you know putting them on the right track to promotion whereas actually when you're looking at that from your perspective you're saying well no because i'm sitting on these two extra committees i've offered to supervise a student in a different department because they're interested in my research and there's lots of various things that's going on in addition to that you're maybe reviewing two to four papers a month for a, for a journal you know which may or may not be being counted into your workload and so in this paper i i gave some hints and tips of how to have these difficult conversations with your line manager how to have these difficult conversations with people who are above you and perhaps might present barriers for your ultimate uh, career progression but yeah I'd, I'd be very interested in some feedback about that article yeah, I mean, it's it's been a while since I since I read the article to be to be honest with you, but I, I re remember when I was reading it, thinking through that I wish that people had told me four or five years ago that I didn't have to do everything that I was invited to do or asked to do to be able to show that I was doing things in higher education. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the idea that you, you don't automatically have to have this intuitive yes, I'll do that response to everything is is really useful. And I think. When we think about the core kind of cause of a lot of mental health issues in academia, burnout is the thing that seems to come up time and time again. Thinking about um, the sheer volume of work and the time packet of the time envelope that you have to complete that work. Um, I read something recently, actually, I can't remember who the author was, but it's thinking about what burnout actually is. It's not about the just the volume of work, it's about the interaction between the volume of work that you have to do and the expectation that other people have of you. Of course, yeah. And it's about, and it kind of ties in, I think, to the fact that you were talking about there in terms of your line manager thinking that you are doing a particular amount of work, but you're actually doing other work. Um, thinking about the amount of hours that you are allocated for particular tasks. So um, it might be that you have a module that you're leading or you're given X number of hours, but actually you're finding that you're doing double that. Um, and trying to manage that so it's about thinking through then how do you actually manage your time how do you make sure that you have the most effective use of the time that you have available and i think that's where some of the tips that we're trying to come up with is is hopefully gonna help people with this in terms of thinking through the fact that we're probably not going to be able to change the way that academia is structured i think that's probably too big a task to do at the minute but thinking through within the constraints that you do have what do you need to do mm -hmm. um, and what can you maybe say no to and of the things that you do need to do how can you do that in the most effective way and i think that they're going to be the three things that really if we're going to be solving this mental health crisis that is currently happening in academia those three things what do you have to do what can you say no to and of the things that you have to do how can you do them effectively and, and efficiently if we can crack those questions if we can make sure that people know the answers to those questions then hopefully what we can do is to reduce this kind of mental health epidemic that is happening in academia. So moving on to talk about some of the ways in which we could perhaps start to um, overcome some of this kind of poor mental health in academia. I'm just going to refer us back to, um, to the Nature article that we talked about in the first part of this podcast. Um, and within that, there was uh, some qualitative data as well. And there is a quote from an academic that said that they were told by a faculty member at their university that if they're not willing to work long hours, then they would need to find a different career. And now I know you've just um, spent some time establishing that perhaps we can't change the structure of universities, but would you argue that this indicates that there's a distinct need for us to change the culture of universities? Uh, yeah, poss possibly. Um, I, I don't think that particular mindset is that rare, to be honest. I, I for example, I, I quite often, um, maybe not so much in the past year, but I have historically worked a lot in the evenings and and weekends, uh, basically trying to get ahead. I guess, kind of, mm. I, I guess, inadvertently contributing to this culture of of increased productivity but not necessarily in an efficient way sure um so thinking through how do we how do we change that culture so that people are working within their 
resources, I guess, while still trying to achieve what they are capable of achieving, what their potential is, is, is really important. Um, that said, I think there is something to be said about the flexibility of, of course. Um, so it might be that if you are particularly a PhD student, if you don't have the kind of regular academic workload of kind of regular timetabled sessions that you're teaching, if you're finding that you're trying to work on a weekend, a weekday, sorry, and you are, you're really struggling to get into the flow on that day, it's, it's okay to stop working for that day, to take a bit of time out, to try and get some kind of headspace so that you can go and attack that piece of work on another day, whether that is on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, you have that flexibility. I know academics who are in academic roles that, are, that do a similar thing. For example, if I am struggling on an afternoon to kind of get into a piece of work, it might be that I take that afternoon and I don't look at much that afternoon, but then I'll come back to it on a Sunday afternoon when maybe um, there's less pressure, maybe. The emails aren't always coming in. Mm. I'm not distracted with other tasks. Um, so I think there's there's something to be said about the flexibility of being able to work on a weekend if that's what you want to do. Yeah. But that is completely different to have an expectation that you work Monday to Friday and you work a day every weekend. Um, and I f it feels like the quote that you read out, that was there was an expectation that you're basically working six or seven days out of the week rather than five days over seven, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100% uh, it makes sense. And I, I, think, I think there is a very niche but important uh, distinction, as you've just kind of um, alluded, uh, to that way of thinking. Now... I'm I'm the first one to say that academia is probably one of the best jobs in the world. You know, it might not be the most paid job in the world, but it does come with that level of flexibility that I don't think other roles have. Now, when we when we talked about kind of not preparing students to go into that role, PhD students to walk into academia, I think one of the key things about that is is you're not working nine to five. You know, um, it, universities are typically in the UK with are open nine till nine, I guess. Um, some some programs also teach on weekends. And so you need to be having these carefully constructed conversations with yourself and your peers in terms of these are the hours that I'm working. Actually, as you just said, I might not feel as motivated or passionate about writing in this particular time that I allocated. And so I'm going to be more productive um, in, in, in a different uh, time slot. And I, I think you actually did a, did a really nice uh, tweet thread um, on, on, on our social media the other day, which um, basically said, you know, that uh, two hours of really in-depth productive work is worth 10 times, you know, like... Uh, six hours of distracted work and I, and I think we we will be going on in kind of future podcasts to talk about some of these strategies where we can consolidate um you know all of our kind of admin tasks and consolidate our writing tasks be more flexible with this block uh way of working but i think it's really important to to indicate that there are some individuals out there that do kind of have this culture that Yes, it's not a nine to five job, but you are expected to be working in addition to to your contracted working hours. And I think that could potentially for individuals who aren't prepared to to say no and individuals who aren't prepared for that flexibility that could come at such detriment uh, to themselves. And so I know that kind of you, you just spoke about writing and I know you're a very uh, prolific um, publisher. So what's your opinion in terms of trying to balance that academic work with this seemingly increased demand to publish as well? Yeah, I mean, there's an adage, isn't there, in, in universities that you either publish or perish. Mm. Uh, the idea that you, you have to have X number of papers in a calendar or an academic year, otherwise you're not doing your job effectively. And we all know that there are lots of people who are publishing really regularly, publishing in a range of different journals, um lots <laughs> in the uh, uh in the course of their their academic life and it's uh, i think there's a there's a there's a change in how people are thinking about this kind of thing at the moment in mm. terms of quantity versus quality and i think there's a, a shift in mindset towards that quality angle rather than quantity and we're seeing things in particularly in psychology where we work thinking about with the replication crisis of course are lots of lots of people who are publishing lots of papers that are maybe single studies 
those, those works typically are not replicating. So there's an issue around maybe quality of some of those papers, whether they've maybe not been thought through enough, whether they've not been uh, run in a way that would allow for replication um, is particularly kind of a big issue at the moment. But also thinking about how do we improve the quality of our work as well as improving our productivity. So collaboration is really yeah. uh, a really big thing. So we've developed networks with various people. We've been on papers together where we've not actually met the people that we are writing with. It's all been through email or Slack channels or uh, yeah, various different forms of communication. But there's lots of kind of these big collaborations now. If you look at the Open Science Framework and what they're doing, um, getting lots of people to work together on multi-study, multi-site uh, papers where you know that there's good quality in those papers, but also you can reduce your workload and your contribution while still contributing to something that is high quality. So I think that's something that we're really big advocates of, actually, at, uh, yeah. uh, at universities and thinking through how do you develop those networks so that you can share the burden of, of still doing good research, but also not at the detriment of your own mental health. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you know me probably better than everyone. I I very much um, like to work collaboratively with people. Um, I think that by drawing on each other's expertise, not only can you have that kind of sound check in, in, in your mind to make sure that your ideas are um, as, as strong as possible, but that bleeds into your research and it makes your research as uh, effective, as impactful as possible. So, so moving on to kind of also looking at um, some different ways in which we can overcome uh, poor mental health in academia and maybe focusing on those um, PhD and early career researchers. Earlier you mentioned, you made a really good point about how perhaps they weren't being as prepared um, to going into uh, academia. And so perhaps that could look as something simple as putting together uh, packages or short courses in the, in the kind of mead time to really prepare them for that different walk of life. Yeah, so I think there's, there's obviously there's space for these more formalized courses through universities, but I think mentoring is also really, really important. If you can kind of learn from someone that you're working with, if you can almost shadow your supervisor, if they're willing to kind of let you do that, not necessarily kind of attending their lectures and things like that, but kind of having regular catch-ups with them about what's it actually like to work in academia? Yeah. What does what does an average day, an average week, an average term look like in terms of workload, in terms of skills that you'll need? Um, and thinking about some of those skills that maybe aren't taught formally in undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, in PhD courses, thinking through how do you manage your time effectively in terms of balancing multiple tasks. I think mentoring, coaching, attending talks are just as important as these formalized um, formalized programs that universities can put together. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. And I kind of guess, just to kind of close out that point, after you've shadowed a potential supervisor, after you've, you know, had these informal discussions that can be really insightful it might actually be that you come to the realization that undergoing a phd or engaging in academia actually isn't for you you know and i think we will be talking in either next week's podcast or, or the podcast after about why people um might want to choose industry over academia and you know and just all the kind of discourse around that but i think it's exceptional that you know to it's exceptionally important to do that groundwork and gain that deeper understanding um and especially in terms of those coaching sessions which you talked about to prepare yourself perhaps for stepping into that world and so i kind of guess one of the one of the final um um potential ways to, to start thinking about how we might overcome this is to also realize the context in which modern day kind of academia is being around we've, we've we've seen that um we can deliver really effective teaching in an online asynchronous sphere you know i mean obviously there will be technical issues here and there but when we are looking at early career academics who perhaps have invested a lot of time and money and resources into completing their degrees um lots of them perhaps haven't been living at home so haven't been able to have that familial or parental support 
we've got an ever increasing cost of living in the uk at the minute we're, we're in a crisis with energy bills going through the roof uh, towards the end of the year now academics who perhaps were hired during covid have got to be making that transition potentially back into the workplace on campus maybe three four five days a week that's obviously going to be in the back of their minds kind of grinding them down as well and having those thoughts about actually I re i'm really passionate about this job in academia but i perhaps i can't see a way of <laughs> doing the figures so that actually I'm able to to have a decent quality of life. And not only have you got that kind of anxiety about this detriment to quality of life, but as soon as you start to not be able to kind of go out for, you know, a, a meal every other week or so and not be able to spend that time with your with your family and loved ones, um, that can potentially proliferate even more kind of depressive or anxiety feelings. Yeah, and I think just for, for listeners that maybe are not that familiar with, with academia, that what you've just said, the picture that you painted there potentially sounds a little bit like first world problems. The idea that we, mm. we're, we're maybe not wanting to go into work three, four or five days a week um, will be alien to a lot of people who have to do that. And I think there's, there's a reason that we would highlight something like that, because if you are teaching on campus, it might be that you're teaching for... A single two-hour block on that day sure now ultimately what that means is that you are traveling into the the campus to deliver that session but for the hour maybe before that session you're not really doing that much because you're having to make sure that you're watching the clock so you get to the room on time for the hour afterwards you're not really doing that much because you're getting back to your office you might be grabbing lunch you might be just decompressing it's quite difficult to stand and talk at a relatively high level Agreed, yeah. to uh, students for a couple of hours to interact with them in in that kind of high intellectual way for for a couple of hours at that point that's four hours of your day that's gone sure you've then got other kind of emails and meetings that you're having to attend potentially virtually to, uh, potentially online to potentially in person so what you're what you're left with then is at that single class that you're teaching on campus which might on your timetable reflect two hours is actually eating six, seven hours of your working week. Now, obviously, that's six or seven hours where you're being paid to work, but you're not able to do the work that you are being allocated, which then feeds into everything else that you're having to do, which contributes to that sense of burnout that we've been discussing, that contributes to this general sense of dread that a lot of people have over the sheer volume of work that they have to experience. So what I don't want to kind of leave in the air there is the idea that academics don't want to work three, four or five days a week. Mm. It's the fact that, so if it's not block teaching, that becomes four, five, six hours maybe that people haven't been able to do other tasks that they've been allocated, um, which ultimately means that people are feeling pressure to work in the evenings or the weekends. So it's not that the academics don't want to work three, four or five days a week at all. It's about the fact that quite often a teaching load will be a single session it may be in the middle of a day where and that then sucks all of the productivity out of that day um which then contributes to this spiral of burnout of feeling like there's not enough time in the day that then feels um kind of anxiety provoking i guess so it's not necessarily the the number of hours or number of days that people are on campus it's what that means in terms of their workload and their their experience of work so i think thinking through some of the potential remedies for this whether we can change that kind of culture of having individual sessions can we think more about timetabling in terms of blocking teaching if you're teaching for 15 hours a week on campus um for some people that might be a heavy teaching load for others it might be an average teaching load um but if you can teach for those 15 hours over two days what that mm. does, it means that you have those three days at home where you can just focus on doing research, thinking about your, your academic administration tasks, where you're not rushing between classes and kind of wasting those individual hours around teaching sessions. Um, it, those individual hours that you claw back quickly kind of compound so that you then have much more time. So it's, it, just, it becomes less about that individual hour and more about the morning that you've just gained back as a result of being at home rather than on campus. 
Yeah, and I kind of guess so. So three points there, and I'll, I'll try and take them in turn. Um, it can almost be completely redefining your mindset. You know, like having that shift isn't just about shifting your location. It's about changing the way that you then go on to approach that day. And if we are instilling this really positive, efficient mindset in students and academics, then actually you are going to see that shift towards a more productive base. Um, I think the second point is, as I think will be a trend within this podcast series, there's lots of very nuanced elements which have emerged. And actually, every one of the kind of three mini sections today, we could have expanded into a into a larger podcast in itself. So that's something which will hopefully be kind of um, adapting on and spending more time and also kind of cherry picking those debates that are raised uh, throughout each podcast and maybe um, delivering some uh, material over, over social media to, to kind of explore some of those topics as well. And I kind of guess the, the, the final point before we close is that um, it seems from what you've just established there that we've been able to come full circle. So we started off by identifying that there is this pervasive um, increase in poor mental health, which is international. It's being faced by PhD students, early career academics, and I would say, you know, more late stage academics um, as well. We have focused this podcast more on PhD students and early career academics and perhaps how they've not been as prepared as possible to not only undertake that um, doctoral study, but also go into that early career role. And a mixture of uh, competing tasks, perhaps an inability to say no, um, teaching schedules which might not be as efficient as possible, all of which accumulates with individuals feeling that they haven't achieved what they're expected to achieve, which might not be measurable each day and across each week, which then perpetuates feelings of, well, I need to work evenings. I need to work weekends, which then maps very cleanly back into the start of the cycle of, well, now I've not spent time with my family, so I'm feeling low mood. And I know I've got a really busy week next week, so I need to prepare for that on a Sunday. And so I'm feeling anxious about that. And you can see how this cycle is just going to escalate. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Completely agree. Um, these things aren't easy to solve. But I think there are there are some things that universities can do in terms of timetabling. There are things that um, supervisors can do in terms of mentoring and uh, training, informal training, there are things that individuals can do in terms of blocking their time, in terms of improving workflows that will, they won't solve all of these issues, but they will certainly help to alleviate some of these negative feelings that they're having, I think. Perfect. So I'm going to draw the uh, the podcast to a close. Thank you very much for, for Craig for joining me today and also for our listeners um, who have subscribed to the podcast. Remember that you can catch this both on YouTube every uh, other week and also on all of the places where you hear all of your podcasts. Um, it should be really accessible. In the meantime, please do follow us on our social medias. We're trying to grow this community. We're trying to grow that Discord community of like-minded students and early career academics who really do want to make a difference. We'll see you next time.